Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing world. Uh, the best way to do that is to follow me on X at at Focused Compound. All the information is in the description below. Uh, wherever you're listening or watching us here today, uh, hit the subscribe button so you will be notified every single time we upload a podcast. So in today's podcast, we are going to continue on with our Outsider series. Um, in the previous one, we spoke about Tom Murphy, and then we had said that we we're going to skip Henry Singleton at Chapter 2, only because we just did a longer podcast on him a few weeks ago. Um, and we're going to skip to chapter three, which is the turnaround, Bill Anders and general dynamics. Uh, so for people that have a book, this is on page 59. And, you know, I got to be honest with you, Jeff, I'm kind of, I'm kind of fanboying a little bit over okay. Bill Anders. I mean, this dude's, basically a, a, a badass, right? Served in the military, uh, you know, did stuff in the defense sector, flies airplanes, flies fighter jets, uh, was part of a, a NASA group thing, as you could see right here. Uh, what is he, a, a, a rocket engineer? I mean, this guy just seems like absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And then our chapter here is about his time at uh, General Dynamics. Oh, yeah. And he also worked at General Dynamics on the side mm -hmm. for, for, you know, for uh, what was it? Three years of, uh, 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 of his life, right? So he worked at um, General Electric and was part of the management program there, which was interesting under Jack Welch. And he eventually ended up at General Dynamics. Um, do you want to give a background to the company before he had uh, come on board at General Dynamics and we could talk about his tenure with the business? Well, General Dynamics uh, at the time was a, a defense contractor and this was at the end of the Cold War, basically. Um, like you said, he was recruited in 1989. Um, so he was offered the chance to be vice chairman, and then later he moved into the CEO slot. Um, and before that, I guess, between where you were talking about with um, G and everything, uh, before that, he was at Textron, which was a conglomerate that is has some similarities, I guess, to General Dynamics um, in the mm -hmm. 80s. So, um, yeah, so he was at the Pentagon, left the Pentagon, went to General Electric, was there for a bit. Um, and then, yeah, like you had said, he was chairman and then ultimately became uh, CEO of uh, General Dynamics. And mm -hmm. something that the book points out is that um, he was the oldest CEO in the book um, yeah. to first start um, as he was in his 50s. And he only had 10 years of private sector experience when he took the General Dynamics post. But you know, the other side of that is that his eyes were very fresh and perhaps maybe he wasn't entrenched in uh, it's the institutional imperative or, you know, what other people think he should do. Right. And he had a three prong approach. They call it three tenets to his strategy. Um, and the first of it was that much like Jack Welch, he believed that general dynamics should only be in the business where it had the number one or the number two market position. Uh, obviously that's what Jack Welch had did with GE you know, we could get your thoughts on that in a second. Number two was the company would exit commodity businesses where their returns were unacceptably low, um, you know, and thereby also less predictable, I imagine, uh, standard commodity business. And then uh, the third tenet was uh, that General Dynamics would stick to businesses it knew well. Specifically, it would be wary of commercial businesses, long and elusive Holy Grail-like source of new profits for defense companies. So mm -hmm. he came in and his strategy was basically to refocus the company. And that started at the CEO level. Just curious to hear your thoughts on the Jack Welch, you know, we're going to be number one or number two. Otherwise, we're not going to be involved 
at all in this business. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it makes sense for some of the businesses that GE was in and certainly makes sense for the businesses General Dynamics was in. Um, General Dynamics, these are defense businesses. They basically have a few customers and those customers are basically the federal government. Um, so it makes sense to say if your focus is on submarines or on a particular fighter jet or whatever, that those are um, a main focus for you as one of the leaders there and not to be in... Uh, lower places there, right? That you're have a much smaller market share for other kinds of businesses, you know, that are different from what we're talking about here with GE and general dynamics. I don't know as much in some consumer businesses that don't depend as much on scale. I'm not sure that you would need to be as focused on being the biggest. Um, you might be focused on other things like the profitability that you'd have in your brand image and those sorts of things. Um, but this makes sense for these kinds of businesses, just as it makes sense for G if it was infrastructure or power or something like that. Um, same sort of things where I think there are advantages to having a lot of scale there and um, to being one of the leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on page 64, it says Anders moved aggressively to correct uh, the focus at the company and still an emphasis on shareholders and on metrics like return on equity, right? So he really went into uh, change the culture at the business. Uh, he replaced a bunch of the executives that were in there prior to him becoming CEO. Uh, at the bottom of the page, it says he was kind of the, he, he talked about the type of people that he wanted to hire. And he hired someone as uh, president and chief operating officer. And the way that Anders described him was he was the kind of guy that would look for the last nickel and hold people responsible. Uh, so you just kind of think about like this cost conscious approach to, um, you know, ch the culture, changing the culture. And, and that has to be instilled throughout all the executives uh, because this was a turnaround uh, situation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he replaced almost all of the top executives, 21 of the company's top 25. So that's almost 85% of the uh, company. Um, mm -hmm. So that's obviously a huge turnover there started focusing on return equity and immediately did things to drop the capital in the business and improve cash flow. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, that at all and what he did? Yeah. So um, the company had negative cash flow when he came in. So they talk about this here. Um, so basically the, the things that are, the outsider's chapter mentions the most, I would say, are a focus on return on equity and a focus on cash generation actual cash flow generation, which, you know, as we'll talk about when you talk about the chart of general dyna dynamics and all of that, some of these defense contractors have improved on that score a lot in the last 30 years or something. Um, so the quality of their earnings is much higher, right? Um, they actually turn into cash. Yeah. So they were return on capital focus and everything that they did had to be justified um, by calculating a return on investment. Um, uh, you know, so there's a, a line on page 65 uh, where it said that, um, you know, more generally, they discovered that plant managers carried far too much inventory and hadn't been calculating return on investment in the request for additional capital. So everything that they did, everything that the managers had, you know, whenever they would ask for capital, there had to be numbers there to back it up. Yep. And specifically cash, like you said, at the bottom of page 65. It says cash return and capital became the key metric within the company, which is pretty similar to Teledyne, where Teledyne adopted our approach of half reported earnings, determining budgeting and bonuses and stuff like that for the heads of the different subsidiaries, but half cash. So um, they no longer paid out bonuses to people and stuff based on just their reported earnings because sometimes the quality of the earnings was low. There, there wasn't a lot of cash generation. Here, same sort of idea. They focused on cash returns on capital, not just reported returns on capital. Uh, so he went and he sold off non-core businesses, right? So his three tenants, one of them was selling off or uh, a business if they're not in a, a number one or number two position with the company. And he was able to free up a ton of cash by doing this. Mm -hmm. So reduced headcount by 60%, corporate staff by 80%. So just like we were saying with replaced most of the executives, they also ended up through asset sales and other things like that, um, getting rid of basically most of the company. Why is that so hard for companies to do? I mean, it seems like it takes somebody new, 
with a fresh set of eyes to come in and refocus the company to be shareholder return focused as opposed to just growing for growth's sake. Yeah, I think that the defense contractors weren't focused on those kinds of things. And the industry had been growing a lot for the last 40 years or so. Um, and then they, they had this big change where it was shrinking down. In, in some ways, this reads a lot like where we talk about the new financial capitalist. This looks a lot like an LBO. The company needed to um, deal with the fact that it was over leveraged. He came in, he focused on cash, asset sales, things that could immediately get them to pay down debt and on a stronger footing that way. So I think if there hadn't been pressures in that way that the Cold War had ended and that the company was over leveraged, um, there probably wouldn't have been as much of a um, urgency to it. You know, mm -hmm. someone might have wanted to do these things and thought that they could improve things by focusing on cash and focusing on return on equity and everything, but they wouldn't have, um, you know, cut, mo mo replaced most of the top executives, cut the company in half, et cetera, in about two years. Mm -hmm. Something that's interesting is this idea of like shrinking a company, but also like improving earnings per share and return on capital. Obviously, that's, you know, something that Buffett has done and something mm -hmm. that Bill Anders have done. When you read about a lot of these managers that come in and have a capital allocation focus, that seems to be the easy pickings that they first go for. Yeah. I mean, I think like Buffett, he didn't have a strategic sort of thinking, um, a thematic focus. You know, he just did what made the most sense. So they talk about how originally they had wanted to, he was talking to Lockheed um, to buy their fighter plane division, thinking that that would help bulk up the business that General Dynamics had, make it one of the biggest in the, you know, like we said, a leader, number one or number two. But instead, Lockheed um, didn't want to sell and made a really high counter offer. And so um, they had to decide whether they wanted to sell then or um, to sell out to Lockheed or to build on. So I think that that's hard for a company to do. They usually know if they're in acquisition mode or if they're in divestiture mode and they don't think about the prices of each that they're getting offered, you know. Um, but th they obviously had a focus on um, what to do. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of these outsider CEOs, Henry Singleton, Tom Murphy, um, and now Bill Anders, I mean, it's almost like they're steering a ship through a storm. And at times you have to, you know, pick up and at other times you have to, you know, pull back. Uh, but when you pull back, there's still opportunity there where you can, you know, buy back your stock, um, you know, sell off divisions or whatever, free up capital. Uh, but then there are times when you could pounce in, you know, which I guess you'd also say be buying back their stock. I mean, it's almost like they're taking what the market is giving them and trying mm -hmm. to make the absolute best of it, as opposed to being like, this is the blueprint. This is the only thing we're going to do. And everything else is just kind of, we're not going to focus on, right? They were focusing on a few core principles. I mean, he focused on decentralization, obviously capital allocation, improving EPS, return on capital, and was gung-ho about that. Um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, he loved the fighter jet division. It, it didn't sound like he wanted to sell it, uh, but he sold it, I, be, I guess, basically on the spot, right? Yes, he sold because it. Because he knew that would be good, yeah. Mm -hmm. He sold it on the spot, and you know, as it mentions in the book, unlike a lot of CEOs too, he actually would have gotten the opportunity to fly their jets, you know, because obviously they, they weren't fighter pilots. Normally that'd be the CEOs of these companies. So he was actually selling the division of presumably the thing that he cared the most about, you know, fighter jets and, and space things and stuff like that is his background. So um, that is a, you know, and that wasn't what he was going into the meeting to talk about. But the quote that they have here, which I think is good in The Outsiders on page 68 um, and what you just said is that uh, a key point across the CEOs in this book is as a group, they were at their core rational and pragmatic, agnostic and clear eyed. They did not have ideology when offered the right price, you know, and then it goes on to talk about what they would do. So basically they didn't have um, a preset idea, not based on numbers about what they were going to do. You know, they could go in thinking we're going to grow the fighter business, but when they get a better offer, they decide instead to shrink it because it makes sense on the numbers. So they're guided a lot by the numbers. Uh, engineering type mindset that way you know we talked about like formulas and the efficiency of it and everything that's very henry singleton type way of thinking about it and buffett they did some interesting things uh with capital allocation on the next page right uh a return of capital while also doing special dividends um that's something that you know we talk a lot about 
and that you know was interesting and the oracle of omaha yeah started to notice everything that was going on um everything we just talked about as well was all done within a three-year time frame right or mm -hmm. his whole you know ceo uh, role at the company was within three years, which is just crazy to think about. So to your point about the new financial capitalists, I mean, it's almost like this was ran like an LBO. Um, but on the next page, page 70, yeah, Buffett started to invest in the company and he ultimately purchased 16% of General Dynamics. And he did something unique. Has he ever done this before where he gave Bill Anders his proxy yes uh, yeah, to yes. basically vote berkshire shares mm -hmm. he did that with um when they did the abc cap cities deal so he yeah. gave the Tom Murphy, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. other than that has he ever done that before i don't know about other examples of that yeah oh yeah i think he gave um don graham the son of k graham um the proxy at washington post i think yeah, it says remarkably he also gave Anders, whom he had only met once, the proxy to vote Berkshire shares. Right. But a position that aided Anders in implementing his strategy. Exactly. He was attracted to it basically as like an arbitrage type situation initially. So he even though he may have only met him that once, he would have already known what he was doing and liked his strategy and wanted him to continue with it, right? And he was going to be a really big owner because, you know, as I said, he bought sixteen percent of the stock, which would be a huge amount for anyone to own in a company like General Dynamics. Mm-hmm. And when Anders uh, left as CEO, Buffett ultimately, he stole the stock. So he really was just there for Bill Anders. But the book does say that uh, Buffett has said he he regrets uh, selling the stock. Yeah, we can look at that in terms of the numbers, but it would have done better than, than other things that Buffett put it in for those years since. Um, mainly because the successors since then have for a lot of them have tried to focus on the same sort of thing that he put in place. So even though he was only there for three to four years, um, his successors uh, adopted a lot of the same things. There was a lot of stock buybacks, for instance. Uh, what they did at the corporate level, as you had said, they reduced headcount. Uh, so he really decentralized the uh, corporate headquarters, put the right people in place, keep them very accountable, make sure they meet their budgets. But other than that, give them the autonomy to do what they have to do. It seems like during this era, you see more of that than you do today, just from doing all these different, you know, situations that we've been talking about recently. Yeah, I think that that's because there was more um, low hanging fruit that way, right? So especially in an industry like this, the defense industry hadn't been shaken up as much as what we talked about with the new financial capitalists in the 70s and 80s, some of the old heavy industry in the United States that was private sector, right? So some of these things had real problems where certain divisions didn't really make money and others, you know, were crown jewels of it. And so there was a lot that could be done by taking that kind of approach. But now most of those companies have been through, you know, if they offer those kinds of opportunities, they've been through one or more LBOs, some of them more than one, because, you know, they, whenever they start to expand or whatever, an LBO happens again, where they say, okay, we can come in and we can slim this thing down, focus it on what matters most, and turn it into something that's really profitable, um, and take it public again, right? So I just think that that's the reason why. It's like what you see with Japan today. There's a lot more focus on like management buyouts and stuff because they haven't done them in the past, and so they're, they're, it's pretty easy to do them. But once a company had a management buyout 10 years ago or something, a lot of things have already been done that you could fix now, you know? Um, so there's probably a lot of fat that it built up and a lot of focus on things that they weren't very good at at General Dynamics in the few decades before then. So he was big on decentralization, being incredibly cost conscious, focusing on capital allocation. He dropped the capital in the business, improved the return on equity, changed the culture for people to focus on return on equity, return on investment, return on capital, um, improved earnings per share. And one thing that he also did that you see from a lot of these outsider CEOs was he changed the compensation uh, scheme for the managers and made it performance-based compensation uh, to reward managers for sustained improvements in the stock price. I thought that was interesting. I don't know if he actually gave them options. I don't, I don't, was it options or was it more so he just paid them out bonuses? So he wanted to do a stock option program 
yeah. but the board didn't want to because the stocks had such a bad performance that they were worried, you know, that they were giving it away at too low a amount that way. Yeah. Because I do remember this part where they talked about the problem was that almost as soon as they adopted the plan, the stock moved. Um, yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. So they paid people out in bonuses. What are your thoughts on that? Giving them options as a form of incentive compensation versus just paying them out in bonuses? Oh, well, we talked about Cap Cities. They did that too. I mean, Buffett's big on bonuses. I think that giving people, although he has given people loans, Berkshire has given people loans to buy stock, though they haven't given them options. Um, so like when he took over the textile mill, I know that they provided loans to the the um, guy running the mill there so that he could buy into the company. So um, yeah, I mean, I think for higher level executives, that's something that they like to do. It's certainly something that's very LBO like. You would definitely have equity in any sort of deal like that. Um and it might make it easier too, because they talk about Anders' successor, who actually had a target that he wanted to quadruple the stock price in ten years. So he calculated what that is and how to do that. And it's easier if you do that if you're giving people obviously options to talk to them about so those specific targets. Um the downside part of it, right, is sometimes the stock moves around a lot for perception reasons or for other reasons that you don't have a lot of control over. So sometimes you can't really give people um, stock that's all that valuable if they come in when it's already very expensive. Um, you know, how they get around this is they reprice the things or they give out new ones all the time. But obviously if you're joining, um, say, NVIDIA now, you might do a great job and the company might do a great job, but it might not ever see those prices again. Um, there's companies from 2000 that did well for the next 10 or 15 years and didn't get back to the stock price that they were at before. You know, I don't know that people who worked at Microsoft from 2000 to 2015 are worse than people who worked from 2015 to 2024 or something. But you know, if their pay was just based on that, then they wouldn't do so well. Um, but like we said, I mean, obviously they give out new things all the time. They reprice things. So it's not a problem usually um, to have a one-time bubble in a stock. Yeah. His successor did things a little bit, differently, right? So Bill Anders never used General Dynamics stock to acquire things, and one of his successors did. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the Gulfstream acquisition? Yeah, and that's also the opposite of what he did. So that's buying into a civilian business, and it was a very big business. It was you know almost half of the company. It was At the time, it was 50%, so that's more like a third of what would be the combined company, enterprise value. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was definitely a big change. I mean, when I remember looking at General Dynamics and stuff, it was after that change had already happened. So analysts and stuff talked about the Gulfstream business as a big part of it and as the company is being much more um, split between the two things. Um, so, and they talk about, you know, the, the diversification from it and all of that. Um, it, it worked out for them, but of course it's the opposite of what we were just talking about. It's something that analysts would like because that's the, something that they probably didn't like in the earlier days um, with Anders is that um, a lot of times companies would be too afraid to be too dependent on one part of the business. A lot of defense companies like to have some civilian business as a way of diversifying, even if it's not as good as the business that they're already in or they have to pay a high price for it. Um, you know, that's a sort of conglomerate type thing that way. They don't like when you become too dependent on one industry and basically one customer of the federal government the rationalization for using the shares to purchase Gulfstream, even though it was obviously a huge acquisition uh, the ceo said what drove me was the realization that the stock was trading at a significant premium to our historic norm 23 times next year's projected earnings versus an historic average of 16 times so what do you do with a high price stock question mark you use it to acquire a premium asset in a related field at a lower multiple and benefit from the arbitrage. So, you know, that's what he was thinking, which obviously makes sense. To yeah. Do. And that's a good point because when they price these deals and they announce them in the press, they talk about it as if it, you're giving up what your stock is worth and getting that at the current price. But if you think that you're trading at 1.5 times your normal multiple, which is about what, what he was saying, um, then actually the deal only costs two thirds of what you're saying it did, you know? So it's reported as, being some deal that cost you, you know, five billion or something, but you're saying that it it was um, quite a bit less than that, right? So um, that 
I think we've talked about that before, like in questions that people ask or something is like, what do you do when your stock is overpriced? Um, that is a very hard capital allocation decision for a public company. The beautiful thing is though, is when your stock in the public markets is usually overpriced. I think traditionally that means the private markets may not be trading at as high of a, mm -hmm. I mean, they don't in general, but that's typically a great time to go and buy companies on the private side. Yeah. And it might also make sense in terms of diversification. If you were, were going to diversify, then when you have really high multiple in your industry, it would make sense that that's the time where you might have a lower multiple in another industry. Um, it would have been really bad to use stock in the early nineties when defense companies had low multiples. Um, but 15 years later, their multiple was a lot higher. You know, from reading when Buffett had invested in the company mm -hmm. and he bought 16% of general dynamics, it says that Buffett, let's see, does it actually say what he made on his investment? Uh, it says Buffett sold his shares on Anders' departure for an excellent return, a decision, however, he regrets today. A lot of it kind of reminds me of what we have seen in Dillard's oh, okay. the past couple of years, mm -hmm. just from the perspective of here you had a business that was going through probably the most challenging time in its history, right? You could probably say. Um, and they came out on the other side, but then they really hit the ground running on capital allocation, started buying back their stock like crazy. Mm -hmm. And if you could recall at the time, the short interest in Dillard's was also just like very high mm -hmm. people betting on, I think, I mean, effectively, you know, them going under through COVID and that's how you have just gotten this insane like return, uh, shout out to Ted Weschler, yeah. uh, since 2020, um, it kind of, I don't know, just from reading what happened, right. It kind of reminds me a lot of Dillard's, but just, you know, different industry and everything like that, but just how the returns and how it all worked out, right. Yeah. Dropping the capital, focusing on capital allocation and really, you know, um, changing the philosophy of the business from that perspective. Yeah, that I agree with that. Um, Dillard's had been doing some of those things, I guess, from earlier on. I mean, the pandemic and everything really pushed them to change the business more to see how efficiently they could run and everything. But they had bought back their stock for a long time and behaved differently than other companies. Um, the other one I was thinking of um, that it reminded me of well, two other ones. One didn't work out too well for him, which was his investment in IBM. But the other one was um, Occidental, which is a big investment for him now. In both those cases, it was them laying out a plan, and just like they had with General Dynamics, which included um, selling down some things and improving returns on capital and, and all of that. So companies that probably had done some things in the past that had not been the most efficient and then trying to improve their capital allocation and probably that they were really big businesses um, that he could buy a lot of stock in didn't hurt. The returns obviously for general dynamics were great. Mm -hmm. uh, just from doing some research uh, before the podcast, it sounds like Bill Anders, he made about 40 million bucks okay. at his time, uh, then never sold or still owned uh, a lot of stock uh, in general dynamics after he left. He stayed on for chairman for another year, and then he effectively retired. And true to his naval background and um, the philosophy of you should never criticize a, a new ship owner or a new captain after you no longer captain the ship, uh, he never spoke about general dynamics, I guess, really in public ever again. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's interesting. Pretty interesting, yeah. huh? Seemed like a very principled man. I mean, I like it. One of the most low profile, I would say, of the people featured in The Outsiders, right? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And if you had held it all this time, mm -hmm. you know, Buffett, obviously the returns have been uh, phenomenal. We could compare General Dynamics to Berkshire. Just be interesting. Well, really, we could do the yeah, S&P S &P 500 too. So the S&P, I mean, is up. I mean, we're going really back to 90. 192, 92, it looks like the SP is up 1,061%. Uh, that's just the price. That's not the total return. Uh, but general dynamics, just the price is up 2,702%. Yeah. So, so the returns have been phenomenal. And obviously, Buffett did own 16% of the company and stuff. Now, we said they used shares and everything, but they bought back stock too at times. So obviously, he could own a big chunk of the company and never have sold for tax purposes or anything if he had wanted to for all those years, for 30 years in investment. So. 
it would have worked very well. What are your main takeaways from Bill Anders? Um, I mean, we'll cover a Ralston Perino one later in the book, I think. Um, and it reminds me a bit of that too. Um, I think that it's interesting in part because it's such a short period of time that it is much more like an LBO than some of the others. Most of these are very, very long CEO uh, histories with the company and the outsiders. Um, in fact, the chapter has what probably as much on his successors as him. Um, pretty close to it. Yeah. Um, so it's a big pivot in strategy. So that's what it, why it reminds me of things like IBM and Occidental and all that, that Buffett likes that. He's often attracted by changing capital allocation strategy because um, he follows the business for a long time and then it's the change in capital allocation that gets him excited. Even Coca-Cola, you know, it, it was starting to see them do smarter things that really attracted him. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're joining us, be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us here today. Uh, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you could go to focuscompound.com and click that invest with us tab or reach out to me directly at andrew at focuscompounding.com. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.